some people kind of, <laughs> some people kind of romanticize um, living in the the olden days. You know when it would be great to to uh, kind of go back to simpler times and everything, but it was not particularly healthy time to be in Tippecanoe County. I mean, life expectancy for somebody born in 1850 was about 38 years. So everybody here in the room here, about the odds are half of us would be dead, okay, at least uh, by this time. Um, in 1850, the percentage of all deaths accounted for by children aged four and under was almost 40%. Four out of 10 children were dead by the time they were four. Okay, just because of the high child mortality. And then the leading cause of death in 1850 was tuberculosis, followed by cholera, dysentery, and fever. So lots of things going through. So this is what the life expectancy looked like here on this chart. Life expectancy is over here 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and then the years from the bottom 18, 1860 up to 2020. And at 1860, uh, about in the middle range of what we're talking about, the average rate age was about 39.4 years. An interesting thing is that of course, in 1865, it dropped because of the Civil War, average expectancy. But for the following years after that, it really didn't change. So life expectancy did not improve all the way up through 1880. So during that period of time, <clears throat> there was really nothing to really improve your chances of living beyond a certain age. Uh, the same people at the same age as when they were in 1850. <clears throat> By 1885, it had started to creep up just a little bit because things were starting to change in tipping of county. And really by 1900, we were up to 48 years being the life expectancy up to where we are today. Of course, it's 78.8 years. So there's quite a difference here in this 120 years there. That means we live a little for a lot longer with that. If we look and see what killed you back then, in 1850, pretty much the first thing was, as we mentioned, was tuberculosis and followed by cholera, Dysentery, which is basically the Hershey squirts, uh, fever, typhoid fever, dropsy. Dropsy is edema. It's um, probably most associated with congestive heart failure, where you may be familiar with it because your ankles swell up and this sort of thing. That was the sort of thing, except dropsy, they actually got it because your abdomen oftentimes filled with fluid. It was called dropsy. Uh, croup, of course, respiratory problems, and then scarlet fever and accident because they didn't have OSHA back then, right? And we operated around a lot of equipment that was very heavy and pretty much you just had to watch out for yourself or you died. So accidents were in the top 10 with that. When we got to 1882, just 32 years later, guess what? Tuberculosis was still number one. Pneumonia, typhoid fever, casualty, which was pretty much the same as accidents. Uh, cerebral spinal meningitis made a surge during the latter half of the 1800s, surprisingly. This is bacterial meningitis, not viral like you get from OS Nile virus, et cetera, today. Uh, bronchitis, probably pneumonia, diphtheria, smallpox. By 1905, number one was tuberculosis. I'm seeing a trend here, okay? Pneumonia, okay, violence started to show up as far as the top 10 causes, diarrheal diseases, cancer first makes an appearance in the top 10 in the 1900s. Um, typhoid fever, influenza, of course, and then cerebral spinal meningitis. And then by 1950, the top one was no longer tuberculosis, but an interesting pattern, cardiovascular disease. Okay, cancer was number two, accidents, pneumonia, motor vehicles, <laughs> we certainly didn't have that before that. Tuberculosis was still on the list, even in 1950, diabetes and the kidney disease. Now, the thing that's interesting in this trend overall is everything highlighted here are infectious diseases. Okay, and as we see, as we get up to 1900s into 1950, 1945 was really when we first started to manufacture our first antibiotic in a large amount, penicillin. Uh, penicillin was actually discovered in 1928, but it took them an additional 12 to 15 years to actually come up with a process to manufacture it. So it was really towards the end of the Second World War when we started to see penicillin, and that made so much difference as far as controlling infectious diseases. Unfortunately, Within five years of penicillin being released, we identified our first bacteria that were resistant to penicillin. It's something that's a battle that goes on today with all of our antibiotics. But it's an interesting trend from 1850 to 1950 about how infectious diseases got far less as things improved in the county. But when you look at the medical care in the 1880s, I'll highlight a couple of things here. 
American dollar doctors generally were slow to accept new scientific methods. There was a lot of research going on in Europe. The American doctors were very firmly entrenched in the traditions by which they had learned their medical profession. Okay, we'll go into that a little bit more. But until the end of the 1800s, end of the 1800s, there was no real understanding of this idea of microorganisms. The term bacteria wasn't even invented until 1883. So most of the, they believe the sickness was caused by fumes or miasmas arising from decaying vegetable or animal matter, climate, or other external conditions. In fact, medical scientists, especially in Europe, were beginning to disprove these theories in the early 1800s. And the old research of cause of disease and treatments were being discovered in Europe, but American medicine did not move into the mainstream until almost 1890, almost the 1900s, before American doctors really accepted what was coming out of Europe. Europe was well ahead of us when it came to medical care. So what was the state of practicing physicians in 1825 to 1875? Well, doctors weren't licensed. In fact, they weren't regulated in any way, shape, or form. There was actually resistance among the medical profession, such as it was, for any government interference in the ability to practice. Now, if you wanted to be a doctor, medical schools were for-profit organizations. They were there to make money and to maybe turn out doctors. But you had paid for admission on a lecture-by-lecture -lecture basis. And I have in my own collection some of the lecture tabs signed by people for getting into a particular lecture on pneumonia. And you attended that. You paid your fee for it. You learned about a lecture from pneumonia about some uh, physician who was prominent in the field. But few really saw the need to pay for the education. Most of them opted for some sort of, if you will, apprenticeship with another physician. So many, many doctors never saw a real patient while they were in medical school. Their first patient they saw was after they hung their shingle out and actually started seeing people. People who were attended to were attended to at home. There was no real organized hospital. In fact, St. E's was the first one established in 1878. So really we didn't have a center to which you went for help. You had the old country doctor who would move by horse and basically come to your home and treat you in the home as best as he could. And I do say he because there were no she at that point, even though there was uh, a, an eclectic medical association, which actually started in the late 1800s that did admit women. As far as medical knowledge, I think we've already alluded to that. Again, the miasma theory was the predominant thought as far as what was causing your cold or your flu or your dys dysentery or whatever it might be. And cholera and black death were thought to be spread by, and this was in all the papers, of poisonous vapor or bad air. The particles contained within were called the miasma, okay, and were identifiable by its smell. You knew when the miasma was around because you could smell it. And of course, what we would say today is that's the smell of death or illness, okay? It was thought the disease rose from contaminated water, foul air, or poor hygiene. And for that reason, oftentimes disease outbreaks were associated or thought to be because of the poor, or because of certain classes in the society, such as the Irish. Things were blamed upon them for no scientific reason, but other than they thought the waterfowl air or poor hygiene was what was associated with the disease. Now, back in 1647, now we're talking again, 200 years prior to the time that we are talking about here today in our lecture, uh, Lewenhoek identified, he, this is actually the first microscope, if you will. This apparatus has a little screw to it. There's a little knob of, of kind of a needle at the end of which he would put a piece of water. And that little dot at the top there is actually a little tiny magnifying glass through which he would look and he could see in water that came out of ponds, algae. He could see the filamentous algae in there and he could see things moving within that. So he was the one who first identified living microscopic organisms in water. And he called them animacules. Kind of like molecules, except these are animals, animal molecules, okay? Now, they wouldn't be called, as I said, bacteria until 1838. <clears throat> but in 1762, so fast forward 120 years, uh, Ben Plates published a theory of contagion that said specific animalcules cause specific disease. That was revolutionary. It was also soundly rejected by scientists of the day. They said, essentially, it was ridiculous, defied logic, that something so very small could inca incapacitate a large organism as a human being. It was total rubbish, and therefore was soundly 
rejected in all the publications of the time. So miasma remained the main suspected cause of many diseases all the way through the time period that we're talking about in the 1800s. In 1847, so midway through our period here, Hungarian obstetrician Ignaz Semmelweis observed, he had read an obstetric ward and the ward had two sections to it. It had a midwives section and it had a doctor's run section. And what he found is that the midwives had a much greater success rate with maternal care after the birth than the doctors did. The doctors lost many more mothers after birth than the midwives did. And he started wondering about that. What he discovered is that the doctors routinely did autopsies between treating their obstetrical patients. So they deliver over here, run to the building next door where there was a autopsy to be performed. They would do that, they would come back and see the next birth, okay? Midwives were not allowed at autopsies. And he noted that difference. And he theorized that doctors were acquiring some sort of agent, unidentified, from the autopsy in the OB ward and bringing it back to the doctor's ward. So what he did is he required his doctors to wash their hands, just chlorinated lime water before they would come back into the ward. And interestingly enough, the death rate on the doctor's ward dropped from 18%, almost one in five dying, down to 2.2% in one year. Evidence that something was a tangible agent being carried from one place to another, and that could be controlled by disinfection. Of course, this was part of the disinfection movement that occurred in the 1800s and was best, especially pushed forward in the United States by the Civil War. Of course, there's Louis Pasteur who identified that by his little experiment where he set up a beaker of broth that should normally ferment things, and he had a, an air channel open to it, but it was filled up with a, a cotton plug to kind of filter things out. And then another beaker that had the same air channel, but was open to the air. And he noticed in his experiment that something grew in the bottle that was exposed to the air, but not in the other identical broth that had the plug that kind of prevented air from getting in. Therefore, he said that in that fermentation that occurred, something had to come from the air because that was the only difference between the two beakers, the one that did not produce anything, the one that, uh, that did generate things. Thus, the previous works began to lay the foundation for the germ theory, which is what would eventually change medicine in the 1800s going into the 1900s. Robert Koch was the one who we speak of even today, uh, medicine will, folks will talk about. He identified and came up with a theory that specific diseases, so Jeff over here had a disease, I would actually isolate or try to find what disease he had, what animalcules or bacteria in this case did he have that I could find. And I would see if other people to which he had associated with actually had that same particular organism. And by making that link, that the same organism that was causing Jeff to be sick today could be found in people that he was around who also had been sick, made the connection that there was infectious diseases. And this became uh, known as the Koch's postulates. Now, the problem is there were few flaws in there because as you all know from COVID, you can be asymptomatic. You can carry a disease, but not show clinical signs, okay? So his postulates basically had to be tweaked a little bit, but he pretty much formed the basis for modern uh, medicine for that. But, so, but back in 1825 to 1875, the thing, era period we're talking about, Koch, Pasteur, and others, their concepts had not caught on in America. In fact, publication in 1884 in America stated, science has no basis in medicine. It does not belong there. That was the attitude in America. It's, uh, being a doctor, you prided yourself on the knowledge you accumulated through your years of experience. And you hoarded that. You didn't share it. You kept it because that's what made you a good doctor was what you had learned through trial and error and unfortunately the deaths of some of your patients. But in America, through the 1800s, bloodletting was still one of the primary care choices, okay? All the way through the end of the 1800s, people were still bloodletting, where literally they would use this wonderful instrument here. We would hope they would disinfect in between, but they would remove up to 6% uh, of the patient's blood. Now, granted, this did produce some effects because by doing that, you kind of put your body into a crisis mode in which it started to mobilize a lot of things, which among other things, would attack whatever organism there was or threat to the body. So in some cases, bloodletting seemed to work. 
But this is a classic example where a correlation between two things happening does not necessarily mean it was a cause and effect. But this was the, this was the state of medicine in America. And throughout the 1800s, apothecaries, homeopathists, hydropaths, people who believed if you merge people in hot baths and so forth, botanical theorists, they all competed for treatments. In fact, if you read through any of those magazines, Harper's Weekly or anything back, you will see advertisements from all of these people promoting claims that they have the cure for fill in the blank, okay? So generally, the stronger the effect of the cure, in other words, the more it made you feel awful by vomiting or purging or whatever it did, the better the drug. If it didn't kill you, it probably cured you, okay? It was kind of the theory with that. Thus, we use such wonderful drugs like strychnine, arsenic, mercury, turpentine, and toxic plants for this heroic treatment. And that was standard of care in America, 1825 through 1875. Let's go back there in the time machine and enjoy ourselves. Okay, 19th century medicine in America generally was a mess. While in Europe, they were following the scientific method. So going back to our life expectancy from birth here, it wasn't until 1890 that America and the United States started to actually buy into the scientific method. And once we did, look what happened to the life expectancy, okay? Which meant, however, if you got sick in Tippecanoe County in 1825 to 1875, you were pretty much on your own, okay? So let's talk about a few of these here. Cholera. Now, cholera was a worldwide scourge. It killed thousands of people every year throughout the, throughout the world. And waves of cholera would move through our country. In Indiana, we had three of them in the 1800s that amounted to thousands of deaths. And it really never went away in between these waves that came through. And oftentimes, they would start in the southern part of the state, and they would move up the river ways, being carried by people who basically traveled and carried the cholera with them northward. It's caused, we know now, by a bacterium called Vibrio cholerasiae. And this bacterium looks like this. It's a little different than kind of the things you learned about in high school with the rods and the cones, with that, or rods and the, uh, and, and the coxide, in that they have little flagellum to them. These guys are modal. They move, okay? And uh, one of the things they do in addition to infecting the GI tract is their little tails also irritate the heck out of your GI tract. So with cholera, you get a raging diarrhea. And the problem with these bacteria is they reside in the GI tract, and then you have a raging bacteria or raging diarrhea. Of course, you are then spreading it, okay, literally. And the diarrhea that comes from that, of course, would get the fecal contamination, would get into the drinking water or the food, and you would then pass it on to the next people. This is why cholera spread so easily. Outbreaks in North America alone in that period, 1866 to 1873, killed over 50,000 people. Cholera just by itself. Now, the thing is, sanitation in Tippecanoe County was not really the greatest during this period of time. After all, our county really had, well, we, we really uh, founded the city in 1825, the county in 1826. So it wasn't a whole lot of really organized government during that, those early years, of course. But even up through 1875, it, your responsibility for sanitation was really up to the individual household. They all had the latrines, they had outhouses, they had pits in the back of the, of the yard. And unfortunately, those pits oftentimes leaked. In other words, the materials would get into the groundwater. And of course, we had wells back then for water also. If you didn't draw it from the creek, you had a well or a cistern. And the wells were shallow. So they're easily contaminated by surface runoff, not only from people, but also from agriculture which meant that your wells oftentimes became contaminated. So cholera and death would pass easily throughout a community. And death was mostly from dehydra dehydration secondary to diarrhea. In fact, in Helm Cemetery, which is out in the West Point area, there's an unmarked mass grave that's filled with a wagon train full of settlers who died from cholera while passing through the area in 1839. When outbreaks would occur, in, especially in small towns, People, because they believed it was the miasma, the bad air, would leave the community, at least the healthy ones. They would leave the sick, the ill, and the infirm behind to fend for themselves, in which case many of them died simply from lack of care. The, the uh, health keepers who would be there for them were no longer. They left town. So during the summers of 1849, 1854, right in the middle of our period that we're talking about, every town on the Wabash was affected by a wave of cholera all the way up and down. 
spread by people coming up through the towns on the riverboats. In fact, during that time, Lafayette lost over 600 citizens from cholera alone. Well, as we finally started to get smarter and as septic tunnels were put in and contained ditches like the Pearl River, as you see that ran right through the middle of Lafayette, downtown Lafayette, it decreased the incidence of cholera because it decreased and contained more of this fecal contamination. All right, so we had better sanitation. But in the rural areas, cholera would still flare up out in the country. Today, with antibiotics and excellent sanitation, it is no longer a threat in the United States. However, cholera still continues worldwide, especially in those countries that don't have good sanitation, uh, poor regions of the world. Well, tuberculosis, we said, was the number one cause in the early 1900s, all the way into the early 1900s. What I've got here is a radiograph, an x-ray, if you will, of a patient. And tuberculosis was also called consumption or the white plague. And part of the reason it was called tuberculosis is because tuberculosis and its bacteria forms tubercles inside the lung. And tubercles are, you kind of see here this little white area like that, that's solid tissue. As opposed to the lung, the air in the lung appears black. So more solid tissue appears kind of whiter color. So there's your heart, here's the lungs on either side, the lungs are air filled with that. And what you see is you see a round structure that has a hole in the middle. Looks like an air filled hole in the middle. Well, it's within that hole in the middle, that's where the bacteria are residing. And what these bacteria do is they actually cause a reaction by the body and the body attempts to wall it off. And sometimes does so successfully, maintaining the bacteria in there. Now there's two things that happen. So one, if the body successfully walls off a tubercle containing the bacteria that cause it, then the active disease seems to go away. The patient feels okay because the bacteria aren't really exposed to the body. And we say that's an inactive form of TB. You still have it. You still have the bacteria, but you're not showing clinical signs. What also happens, though, and we still have this problem today, is because of that wall that protects the body from the bacteria inside of it, also prevents antibiotics from getting into the bacteria, which makes tuberculosis a very difficult disease to treat with modern antibiotics. But anyway, the bacteria that reside in here are called mycobacterium tuberculosis, and they're transmitted by coughing. When these tubercles would break open and get into the airways, the bacteria would, then people would cough. The sputum would basically shed the bacteria, but you could also get it from cows by drinking unpasteurized milk, because cows also get tuberculosis in different species, mycobacteria bovis, bovis meaning bovine or, or cattle, is transmitted to people who drank unpasteurized milk. The thing is that TB can exist for years in humans, causing a wasting disease, hence the term consumption that was commonly used to describe tuberculosis. Um, if you've ever seen some of the old, um, I think it was a, it must have been an old movie version of the OK Corral, and Doc Holliday had tuberculosis. And he was very gaunt and emaciating. He had it for a number of years, eventually did kill him. But he had it probably for 30 years and didn't die from it. And that's part of the thing about TB and why it spreads is because it does not kill you right away and gives you the opportunity to share it with your friends and neighbors. In the 1800s, of course, people knew of consumption, and there were lots of quackery about it. I mean, you could get your white plague armor, okay, your armor against tuberculosis. And if you wore this guaranteed or your money back, that you would not get tuberculosis or consumption. But essentially, people lived with it and oftentimes died with it or died in conjunction with other diseases with it. In Tippecanoe County, we really didn't even start fighting against TB actively until after the turn of the century. In fact, in 1904 was the first uh, organized event where they established TB camps or shacks. Because you remember, if you just got good air, as opposed to miasma, bad air, you would get better. Well, that kind of followed through with TB all the way into the 1900s. And people, of course, would be recommended to go to Arizona for the good air there, to recover, to go to sanitariums in Arizona until about 1935 or 36, when somebody published a paper and pointed out to an interesting fact that you're more likely to die from TB in Arizona than you are in Indiana. So go figure. But anyway, milk pasteurization, of course, reduced TB in the 1920s, at least that route. And we today, we still TB test cattle to try to test them for that. If any cattle is found TB, uh, the cow itself and maybe the entire herd is depopulated. So for public health reasons. So it's still with us today. And really, we saw a resurgence of it when we had AIDS first hit the scene back in the 70s because 
when you have an immunocompromised person or your immune system is not up to snuff for whatever reason, like if you're on uh, anti-organ rejection drugs or something like that, or you have AIDS or HIV, um, that tubercle that's in there, that the body has successfully kept the bacterium there, that process breaks down. The body no longer is able to keep it in check and so the bacterium can get out and get systemic, get into the bloodstream and cause active TB. And that's why we saw in IV, when, uh, HIV patients, we saw a resurgence of TB among those patients. Now, here's another one, ague. Anyone ever heard of this one, ague? Okay. Well, it was widespread death. Uh, it would be typically what you'd have a sudden onset. So, I mean, you were fine one minute, and within a period of maybe five minutes, you would have a sudden violent chills and a fever, typically uh, lasting. Um, for a few hours and then it would go on, but it was almost predictable. You could set your calendar by. From August to October in Indiana, people were expected to get ague. In 1914, a history article on Hoosier pioneers said that uh, they attributed ague to the impurities of stagnant ponds and streams, which we would call the miasma theory, okay? Still in 1914. The people who were affected wore yellow faces and moved about with a heavy lassitude. They just simply had no energy, but they often tried to keep going, okay? But the chills were so violent, the sick person's bed would creak, followed by a fever that lasted for hours, not days, hours. And then the fever would subside, only to return the next day or maybe every two days on a recurrent pattern over and over again. Now, some of you may be saying this kind of sounds like a disease we deal with even yet today. Well, this is malaria. This is malaria. And we oftentimes think of malaria as a tropical disease. But if you notice this red marks on this, malaria outbreaks went all the way up into Wisconsin and Michigan, halfway up the state of Michigan. Malaria was very, very common in the eastern part of the United States because the conditions for the Anopheles mosquito that carries the agent for malaria was very able to propagate. Now with better sanitation, draining in swamps and those sort of things, the Anopheles mosquito does not have the habitat to inhabit this area now. So we don't have many incidents of malaria in the area where we are now. But back in the day of the 1800s, it was a problem. And as we saw there, a frequent recurring problem in Indiana and in Tippecanoe County. It wasn't until 1880, so really after the period we're talking about, that Alphonse Levera, uh, Levera a French physician working in Algeria actually identified the organism that caused malaria by seeing in a red blood cell a parasitic, a parasitic organism moving. And that's where he discovered plasmodium. Plasmodium is, a, is a, actually a blood parasite and it's that plasmodium parasite that is carried by the Anopheles mosquito, injects it into you, it inhabits your red blood cells, it propagates, and what it does is periodically in a mass kind of coordinated action, it will lice, break apart your red blood cells to release the young of that parasite so it can infect other red blood cells. That release, that massive destruction of your red blood cells causes you to have the chills and to have the lassitude. I don't have energy. Well, your red blood cells have been lysed, okay? But it only lasts a few hours because that's how long it would take until the bacteria, the uh, plasmodium would find new host cells inside the same patient and take up residence until 24 to 48 hours later, it would repeat the cycle. So the classic of malaria is you have series of chills over and over and over again, very violent chills with that. The yellowing of the skin is because when you release hemoglobin from the red blood cell, hemoglobin contains a pigment, a yellow pigment. And that pigment actually makes its way into your skin and turns your skin yellow. That's what we call jaundice or ictus, it's because of the lysing or the breaking apart of the red blood cells. Well, the thing is, the Europeans, again, were way ahead of us. In 1640, the Europeans had learned from Peruvian natives about a bark of a tree called the chincona tree that would cure malaria. And they brought this back to Europe, and Europe was using this treatment from the chincona tree since the 1600s. In fact, Queen Victoria was treated for malaria with chincona bark. In 1825 to 1875, our period that we're talking about, some American physicians kind of knew about quinine, quinine being the active ingredient in the Jacona bark tree that cures malaria. But they preferred to use other treatments instead, including calomel, which was simply mercuric chloride. In other words, mercury 
which we all know to be poisonous, right? And mercury was routinely used for treating intestinal worms. So if it's treating intestinal worms, let's try it on malaria, okay? And actually it had a little bit of an effect on those parasites because the plasmodium that causes malaria is not a bacteria. It's a single cell organism, protozoa, much more susceptible to things like mercury, just the same way as intestinal worms would be. All right, so it actually had a little bit of work and for that reason, this was still considered one of the primary treatments for malaria all the way through the end of the 1800s in America, not in Europe, okay? Well, in 1821, an outbreak of malaria almost doomed Indianapolis. Now, you remember our Indiana history, they moved from Corden capital up to Indianapolis in 1820, okay? And in 1821, they had a really uh, bad summer with a lot of rain, they had swampy conditions and that allowed the Anopheles mosquitoes to propagate and oppress malaria. Now, we don't think of Indianapolis as a swamp, but if you drive down 65 to Indianapolis and you kind of get uh, just inside, not quite to the loop of 465, but you kind of come over a ridge, you can see it's the first time you see the buildings in downtown Indianapolis and you see the uh, Salesforce Tower. You're not looking at the very bottom of Salesforce Tower when you do that. You're looking only at the top. The reason being is Indianapolis sits in a bowl. It literally was a swamp and still is until they redrained everything and re-engineered the water with that. It was literally a swamp filled with mosquitoes and a horrible place to live. So uh, William W. Mayo, the father of the two brothers, sons, his two sons that founded Mayo Clinic, was working in Lafayette in the 1840s and 1850s as a tailor. And he actually worked there as a tailor until with the 1849 cholera, he actually helped with the cholera and that spurred his interest in studying medicine at that point. Now the thing is that William W. Mayo in 1854 was kind of tired of malaria. This is a quote, tired of frequent bouts of malaria, he left Lafayette in search of a more healthful climate, which he found in Minnesota. You know, if we hadn't had malaria here, the Mayo Clinic would have been right here in Lafayette. <laughs> Now, let's show the picture again. The lowlands around the Wabash River and the path where the Erie Canal is being put in were classic for swampy areas and, of course, lots of mosquitoes. Because of that, malaria was rampant among the uh, workers on the canals. In fact, there is a cemetery that's on private land over here in Union Township. Here's uh, the Watanon Preserve, it's here for Fort Watanon Park to give you an idea where it is. But that is a ground filled with Irishmen who died from malaria outbreak in 1847. Hundreds of, of graves were there and they're unmarked, okay? That all died from malaria because of that. So in 1825 to 1875, you had a good chance of encountering all kinds of wonderful diseases with no proven cure, such as scarlet fever, smallpox, diphtheria, meningitis, whooping cough, typhoid fever, dysentery, diarrhea of any causes, pneumonia, influenza, and the list goes on. Well, I refer to, when some of us were talking at the beginning, I refer to a mortality schedule. And this is what I have here. This is a listing of what everybody died from at Dickey County in 1850. It's a mortality schedule. And there's some interesting terms on here with that. For example, there's something in there called congestive fever or remitting fever. Any ideas what that is? Well, that's another name for malaria. That's what they called it, okay? Remitting fever, the fever kept coming back, right? Okay, recurring congestive fever. Delirium tremor, what's that usually referred to? Yes, it was plain old whiskey withdrawal, okay? And there were a couple of deaths that were in there according to delirium tremor, okay? There was a lot of drinking going on in Lafayette during that period of time, <laughs> by the way. Uh, lung fever, what do you think about that one? What do you think that's called? Pneumonia. Yeah, pneumonia, exactly, you're right. Uh, there was another one, flux, which is basically anytime you're oozing fluids from the outside that should be to the outside that should be kept inside, that was called flux. Okay. So urine, feces, blood, anything that oozed from your lot died from flux. And there's a number of people listed in here that died from flux. Okay. Of various ages. <clears throat> French pox, great pox, loose disease, and bad blood. All the same name for one particular disease that was pretty widespread. Well, it posts, well, it's not smallpox, though. It is syphilis. <laughs> okay, yeah, because nobody wanted to call it syphilis. They called it all these other things, okay? And here's one, one of my favorites, scrupula. It's just kind of a cool word, but it appears on this on this list here with that, 
And I had no idea what that was. So I had to look it up. Any, anybody want to venture a guess? I couldn't tell from the name. It's TB of the neck and draining tracts. When tuberculosis comes into your body, it may actually get into your lymphatic system, the lymph system, or end up residing in your lymph nodes in your neck where it forms an abscess. Kind of like those tubercles, tubercles in the lungs, except in your lymph node, and the lymph node will drain to the outside, and that was called scrofula. Okay. And then here's one you might be able to figure out: scrum pox. Now think about it. The word scrum. Where have we heard that term before? We're not in Europe, so you may not be as familiar with it. But scrum is associated with a certain European sport. Rugby. Rugby, exactly right. And scrum is also defined as a disorganized conglomeration of people together. In other words, people with each other, coming in contact with skin, physical contact with skin. Today, today we call that impetigo, or where strep or staph infections that you get by being with other people, okay, where you kind of rub up with them and so forth. A scrum pox, if you will, or just basically a strep or staph skin infection transmitted from somebody else in gym class. All right, <clears throat> so did Tiffany County folks die from snake bite? I didn't mention that on the list there, Yes, there are a couple in here because we actually have three poisonous snakes in the state of Indiana. There are copperheads, there are massasauga rattlers, and there are timber rattlesnakes. Now, the thing about these snakes, they're all what we call pit vipers. And they can be deadly because again, they're well set up uh, with, with fangs and so forth. Their front fangs are hinged and as they open their mouth, their fangs actually extend outward, okay? And when they strike, and pressure, when they attach to their prey, actually pushes on this large sac that's in the back of their jowls that pushes on the venom and forces the venom out, like pushing on a rubber ball through the fangs, which are hollow like hypodermic needles. Now, again, snakes don't want to bite you because, well, there's no reason for it. They're not obviously going to eat you, okay? But the things that are in the venom are primarily digestive compounds. Okay, because what they're doing is they are mobilizing, they're injecting their prey. Let's say they're trying to bite a rabbit. Snakes are not going to be able to keep up with a rabbit, okay, when the rabbit takes off running. So they inject them back off so that the rabbit won't turn around and bite them or injure them. And then they wait, biding their time, because the venom will work immobilizing the rabbit because of some parts of them, and then partially start digesting their prey. So when they come along, they can then eat their snack. That's what the venom does. So pit vipers, though, can control the amount of venom. And this is why even if you get a bite, especially if some of our pioneers would get bites, but they wouldn't die from them. Because defensive strikes, which oftentimes are what we encounter as human beings when we stumble upon snakes, are defensive bites where they just simply strike and they will pull back and run away or crawl away. Uh, there's a little venom injected because they don't really hang on and push into it to actually express the venom sac. But offensive strikes when they're going for their food, again, they grab on and the venom is all expressed. And then agonal strikes, in other words, if you kill a snake or, or injure it, so it's an agonal, it's rolling around the ground, so forth. Yeah, you get bitten by then, you'll get the full venom load. All right. And then this is also true. Decapitated snake heads can bite reflexively for up to an hour after decapitation. That is not a wife's old wives tale. That is a fact. It's kind of like the same process that causes rigor mortis in people or animals when they die. That stiffening that you get. The head will do the same sort of thing in a reflexive way. It's not like the head's gonna bounce around coming after you. <laughs> All right. Well, the copperhead is one of the three snakes we mentioned. Forest mixed woodlands. Again, they like to live near streams where prey is plentiful. They like to hide on stone walls. And my experience with them has only been with um, rock climbing back when I was in high school. And uh, I was climbing up a wall, it was kind of a clay wall down in Brown County, pulled myself up, it was during the spring, it's a nice day, and I came nose to nose with a copperhead, who was just kind of sitting there, and because it was a cooler day, it was kind of sluggish, and I just kind of lowered myself back down, <laughs> went my way, but typically they're in the southern half of Indiana, so probably not typically New County. But this one is here in Tiffany County. This is the Massasauga rattler snake. This rattlesnake. This is a actual rattler. It's in the northern third of Indiana, including us. They're considered sluggish and shy snakes. We don't see them around a lot because, again, they avoid humans at all costs. Um, they move to. They're sometimes found in woodland, wet woodlands, but they're mostly in the wetlands. And they're kind of bulky snakes. They get to be about three to five feet long, so they're not small. Um, they have these saddles, these brown splotches to that. 
uh, thick, bulky body, and they have this line that runs across their head by the eye. This is a close up again, showing the same sort of thing. And again, these are endangered species, by the way. These are protected animals because there are so few of them. So uh, <laughs> it's not, not a, it's against the law to actually kill them. Timber rattlesnake also found in this area somewhat. Um, <clears throat> they'll found, they're potentially one of North America's deadliest snakes because of the long fangs they have and the high uh, venom volume with it. However, they have a pretty mild disposition. There's actually been reports of kids picking these things up and playing with them and not being affected by them or being bitten by them. Uh, so they, they really leave us alone for the most part. But again, bites are rare, but they are found in our area a little bit, even though the, this shows in the southern part of the state, it actually moves up to Tippingham County. So again, the way you recognize those, the rattlesnake, they have black tails with a rattle on them, cross bands, and then this uh, rust colored stripe over the vertebrae with that. So again, um, snakes, yep. They actually would produce things with that it would kill us, but not that many. If you read through the here, I think there's only one snake bite in here. But there were a lot of bites probably, but not, not many more fatal. But there were a lot of deaths from milk fever, milk sickness, or what they also called puking fever. Now, as late as 1915, so we're talking the 20th century, doctors still did not know what caused milk fever. Signs included trembling, progressive weakness, eventually causing kidney failure, renal failure, and death in about seven to 10 days in a high percentage of people. You'd have entire families that might be wiped out by milk fever. <clears throat> it's usually traced back to the milk from a single cow. So the question was, what caused it? Asthma, animalcules, white snake root, white snake root. A very common weed that grows here in Tippecanoe County and really throughout Indiana. <clears throat> White snake root contains a toxin called trematol, tremors, okay, which inhibits the body's use of, of, build, of getting rid of lactic acid. So when you work out, your muscles get burning, so forth. That's, that's because you're accumulating lactic acid within your muscles and you can't metabolize it very well. Well, trematol interferes with the ability of the body to get rid of lactic acid. And so over a period of time, the muscles actually degenerate because of the lactic acid accumulating within them. Now, this also includes the heart muscle itself. The snake root trematol is also nephrotoxic, kidney poisons, okay, nephro-kidney. So cattle would eat this, especially in the drought season, because toxic plants generally are very bitter tasting, and cattle won't eat them unless there's nothing else to eat. But they would eat this when there were drought periods and there was little else to eat. And the milking cattle are not affected because, in a weird twist of fate, the poison is not excreted by the kidney. It's not excreted by the liver, as probably 99.9% .9 of your poisons are. It's only excreted in the milk. And if you're not milking, you're dead. Okay? So for that reason, the bulls would die. Calves nursing off the affected cow would die. Non-milking cows would die the one that is giving the milk to the family is going to live in a weird twist of fate. So the cow would live and the family would die. All right. That's how snake white snake root works. And you can go out here. You can, you can still go out uh, now in our season here, even though we're getting to fall and you can find white snake root at the edge of woods and open areas around the woods, uh, those sort of things. Uh, as soon as our farmers in Indiana started uh, fencing off, feeding grain to their cattle and fencing off pastures, milk sickness disappeared. In fact, it disappeared without anyone really knowing why it occurred in the first place because they didn't understand what caused it. <clears throat> so here's your trivia question. What U.S. president's mother died from milk fever? Any guesses? Lincoln. Lincoln. Very good. All right. Yep, Abraham Lincoln's mother, Mary Hanks Lincoln, died in Perry County, Indiana in 1818 from milk fever. Okay, fortunately, Abe did not die. Okay, so, all right, here's another one caused a sudden death from a deadly gathering of greens. Okay, this plant's a member of the same family as parsnip, parsley, celery, and carrots. Well, how bad can that be? And it grows here in Indiana quite a bit. The flowers and leaves even smell like parsnip or uh, look like parsnip, but they smell like fresh turnips. And the tuber has a somewhat sweet taste to it, but it killed many pioneers who mistook it for other green edible plants and would either boil it or actually add it to their, their diet. 
In fact, in modern day today, U.S., it killed 58 people in the period of 79 to 1988 who mistook it for an edible green plant. This is water hemlock, okay, Secuta maculata. Okay, again, grows widely across our county here. Uh, it is considered to be one of the most poisonous plants in the entire United States. <clears throat> Severe poisoning will occur with ingestion of just two bites of the tuber. So the one that looks like and kind of smells like a uh, turnip, okay? And can produce seizures, respiratory failure, and death within an hour. In fact, there are multiple things written up about people who died because they're out foraging for plants, or in the case of one was a uh, Colorado uh, river guide who wanted to show the people on his guide when they pulled up the side how to, how to forage off the land. Yeah. And so we're doing created a salad that unfortunately contained water hemlock. He died. And the people, of course, were kind of stranded there going, well, what do we do now? Okay, you know, we're in the middle of the Grand Canyon with, you know, a dead guy. So anyway, Cicutoxin is named for the genus Cicada. What it does is it blocks inhibitory neurotransmitters in your brain. In your brain, you've got two types of chemicals that work on it. Excitatory neurotransmitters that excite other neurons and inhibitory neurotransmitters, chemicals that dampen them, kind of like brakes. And your brain's constantly in this back and forth between these excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory. And about where we are now, about 40 minutes into our lecture, the inhibitory neurotransmitters are starting to win, okay? <laughs> so I have to keep doing things to stimulate the excitatory. Well, what cicutoxin does is it blocks the inhibitory side, allowing all of the excitatory neurons to have the brakes taken off. So they all start firing and there's nothing to check them. So what you get are convulsions and seizures. And that's really what is the primary effect of it because of what's going on in the brain with the poison. People die from hyperthermia. In other words, they have continuous convulsions. And of course, you know, just from working out, you generate body heat. So people who get this, they get the convulsions, which are severe muscle contractions, continuous, and their temperatures easily get up to 105, 106, 108, 110. By that point, you've toasted the brain, okay? Um, and then respiratory paralysis, there is no antidote. Treatments are mostly supportive. They don't have anything that can reverse the effect. So that is something we had here. And then we have this. We have hallucinogenic tea that some of our pioneers encountered, okay? It's a wild herb. This is a wild herb found throughout most of the U.S., including here in Tipico County. In fact, uh, we've got some of this in our back, backyard. Uh, belongs to the same family as nightshades, which are generally thought to be kind of poisonous plants. It's called the thorn apple for the prickly coat that it has on the seed pod, or it's sometimes called the angel trumpet for the shape of its flower. This is jimson weed, jimson weed. And it's named for Jamestown, as in Jamestown, Virginia, 1676, because that's where it was first described. And I've got a little, I've got the excerpt here from the description with it. It went back to Jamestown where British troops had been called in to suppress the uprising of Bacon. For those who remember your history, there was a problem with the uprising of Bacon near Jamestown. And the report that comes from the leader of this group of British soldiers is as such. The Jamestown weed, which resembles a thorny apple of Peru, I take to be one plant so-called, is supposed to be one of the greatest coolers in the world. And I'm not certain what that means. This being an early plant was gathered very young for a boiled salad by some of the soldiers sent thither to pacify the troubles of bacon. Some of them eat plentiful, plentifully of it, the effect of which was a very pleasant comedy. For they turned natural fools upon it for several days. One would blow up a feather in the air, another would dart straws at it with much fury, another stark naked and sitting in the corner like a monkey, grinning and making mouths at them. A fourth would fondly kiss and paw their companions and sneer in their faces with a countenance more antic than any Dutch droll. In this frantic condition, they were confined, at least they should then, in their folly, destroy themselves, though it was observed that all their actions were full of innocence and good nature. Indeed, they were not very cleanly, for they would have wild in their own excrements if they'd been allowed. A thousand of such simple tricks they played, and after 11 days, returned to themselves again, not remembering anything that had passed, or at least not claiming to. <laughs> so that is a description of the effects of what we call Jimson weed, Jamestown weed, okay? The plant has been used for centuries and known for its what they call anti-cholinergic 
uh, drug properties, especially, it was actually mentioned in Homer's Odyssey, okay? And anticholinergic means it contains a compound that blocks a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine does lots of things in your body. Uh, but essentially what it does is you have the kind of fight or flight response to your body. That's one thing where you fear, you know, you basically fight or flight. And then the other part of it to kind of rest and restore the other balance to it is modified by or moderated by acetylcholine. That's what causes you to calm down. Well, this drug is anti-cholinergic. It blocks the acetylcholine that would normally calm you down. So you get this fight or flight response. And there are therapeutic things that you can do with that. Anticholinergics counter the bronchoconstriction you get from asthma. They open up the airways. They also decrease intestinal crampings because acetylcholine is what causes your guts to bind up and it'll contract. That's what normally causes motility and conditions that make you urinate, okay? When it comes to urination, I apologize for those of you who have to go to the bathroom, but acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that contracts your bladder with all that force and expels the urine. Well, anticholinergics block that. So it was used for a number of things, but the thing is that at high doses, the anticholinergics affect the brain causing hallucinations. Well, jimson weed leaves and seeds were sometimes put into tea and brandy and then given to treat asthma or give a lift to a depressed patient. I guess if you had a little hallucination, that would give you a lift. And somebody did it and they determined that 100 seeds contained about six milligrams of atropine, one of the active ingredients, which would deliver the therapeutic effect. But here's the problem. 10 milligrams of atropine is considered lethal. <laughs> so the dose at which you had your beneficial effect was real close to the dose that killed you. So because of variability of atropine, scopolamine, and hyoscyamine, those are the three drugs that are in here, dosing was difficult, often fatal, but it was still used widely. Today, teenagers still experiment with Jimson weed because they hear about it, okay? This is from, these are kind of older, Chicago Tribune, October 24, 97. About teenagers here, uh, another one from up a little bit farther north um, around uh, Calumet City. And then I've got another one uh, from Lowell, Indiana, where a teenager died after taking gypsum. So they still try this stuff because they want to get the high from it. But as we saw there, the dose between hallucinogen and death is not very different. Now, finally, bread made from this could make your fingers fall off. Okay. And it did in some cases here in Tippecanoe County. This is a fungus that grows on seed heads of grains or grasses under the right conditions, okay? This seed-like structure here was used, actually recognized by midwives in Europe to induce labor contractions in humans, okay? After observed that cells, pigs, female pigs that fed on these little seed structures here would go into premature labor. And so somebody said, well, let's try this on humans and see if it gets them to go into labor if they stop having contractions. And sure enough, it worked. Man, how do you like to be patient number one on that? Okay. By the 1750s, these seed like structures were stocked in all European pharmacies as pulvis ad partum or dust used to create. And in the new world, it is widely adopted, but <laughs> true to form, what we talked about before. It was used with less rigor and standards in America than it was in Europe. Hence, a lot of doctors created stillborns or killed fetuses right outright because of the effect of these of this compound. So this is ergot. This is ergot, a fungus, Claviceps purpura. Now the ergot fungus would infect seed heads when uh, uh, called a sclerotum. That's what the black thing is. So it actually replaced the seed head with this kind of uh, what I call mouse turd looking thing, okay? Uh, the ergot would infect the grains. And then what would happen is that when they ground the grains up to make flour, the ergot would go right with it. And so you could actually have your flour laced with these ergot uh, type seedlings here. The ergot alkaloids, which are the chemicals in it, are extremely powerful. And because as we showed, they're already been recognized to use as drugs in Europe back in the 1600s. But one of their major effects is to stimulate smooth muscle in the body. When we talk about smooth muscle, you know, your heart, your muscles here are skeletal muscle. That's not it. Your heart's cardiac muscle. Smooth muscles, all the things that cause like your intestinals to contract, your blood vessels to contract, anything, your esophagus, et cetera. All those are smooth muscle. And this drug contracts smooth muscles all over the body. But one of the things it does is in small arteries, it would cause so much contraction 
it would actually shut off the blood to the tissue that was downstream. Vasoconstriction. Cattle fed ergot infected grain over time developed dry gangrene. Okay, and that's what we're actually showing here. Uh, this is from North Dakota State University. But you have a line of healthy tissue up here, and then this is all dead. Now, it doesn't look bad, and frankly, it doesn't smell because it's dry gangrene, it's mummified tissue. And in fact, uh, reports in talking about humans, and especially in Germany, where this very, very widely uh, happened, you would have patients who would walk in carrying a foot. Yeah, gross, huh? And go, I got, I got a problem, doc. <laughs> okay. So caused by ergot-induced vasoconstriction. In villages or families where bread was made from ergot-infected grain, signs of what they would call St. Anthony's fire would actually occur. Uh, people would complain of a burning or tingling in their fingers, toes, or the tips of their nose. And it would worsen until a day when they didn't feel anything in those areas anymore. Must be getting better. Well, no, the tissue turned dark, which gave it the term St. Anthony's fire because it looked like burn, and then would fall off with minimal bleeding. So the other thing, though, that ergot alkaloid also included a potent brain stimulators very similar to LSD. So some ergot infestations would produce vasoconstriction effects, and you get the dry gangrene. Others would produce hallucinations. And in a 1976 article in Science Magazine, which is not a shabby scientific magazine, put forth the hypothesis the behaviors of the villagers that spawned the Salem witch trials may have resulted from ergot tainted bread that was served during that year because the health, the, the weather conditions were ideal for generation of ergot in the grain in that year. So it's an interesting theory, the hallucinations. So 1825 to 1875, so many things to die from. Okay, there's hydrophobia that we didn't mention, black widow spiders, okay, black nightshade poisoning, poison hemlock ingestion. It just goes to say, we better be thankful we're living in Tippecanoe County in 2022 and not in 1875 to 1825. Okay. All right. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.